So to ask somebody who they are is uh, actually to ask them many uh, things because you want to know what people are at their work, what they are in their off time, what they are with their family and friends and so on. But I'll take this to mean, who am I uh, as a working scientist? I'm a neurogeneticist, that is that I use genetics as a tool to investigate problems of the nervous system. I'm interested in two problems in particular. One is the problem of how different nerve cells arise. We have a general question in developmental biology of differentiation, that is how different cell types arise. We want to know how do nerve cells arise as opposed to muscle or skin. But we also want to know how different types of nerve cells arise. And I use genetics to try to find those controls. I'm also interested in how nerve cells function. And in particular, I've been interested in the problem of sensory biology. That is how organism senses touch. Uh, touch is a problem that uh, is really one of the big unknowns. In fact, there's a whole series of what are called mechanical senses, that is senses that are driven by mechanical or physical stimuli. And we really, as scientists, don't know anything about how they work. So we don't understand about hearing, about balance, about how we detect blood pressure within us, how we sense touch, and we do that by at least five different cells. All of these senses work because the cells are moved about. And somehow that leads to an electrical signal in the cells. But we have no idea how that works. What we've been doing is using genetics to find mutants in a very small worm that are insensitive to touch. And this has given us some insights into the molecules that are needed for this basic sensory modality. What I won the Nobel for was the introduction of the use of a very fascinating protein called the green fluorescent protein, or GFP. Green fluorescent protein was originally found by Osama Shimomura in the jellyfish, Acoria victoria. This is a bioluminescent organism. It produces light. But the interesting thing is that the jellyfish have a molecule that produces light, but it produces blue light. The jellyfish are green. And Shimomura realized that there had to be another protein, one that converted the green light into green light, into uh, blue light into green. And that protein, green fluorescent protein, can be activated simply by shining blue light on it. I realized that if this protein were put into other organisms, into other cells, then we could see those cells or those organisms or those proteins, if it were attached to proteins, simply by shining blue light onto the specimen. And we'd be able to see where those things were because they'd be green. And those experiments worked. And GFP has now been used by really thousands and thousands of scientists to investigate a wide variety of problems in biology. We don't set out to be creative. I think that's, at least I don't set out to be creative. I set out uh, thinking about a problem or trying to investigate a phenomenon. And I think that when one gets information and starts thinking about the information, uh, your mind plays with this, or at least my mind does. And I think these connections that come uh, really come out of the blue. I don't know what really occurs if I often to do more. Uh, but I like playing with data. I like thinking about uh, problems. Uh, the GFP problem, or the, the work with GFP started uh, really, I think, because of, of three things. The real trigger was a seminar that I heard in which the speaker talked about GFP as a fluorescent molecule. But there were lots of people in that room that listened to that same seminar. I think I was the only person in the room, though, 
that had a combination of um, things going on in my life that made me perhaps a little more receptive to hearing that talk. The first was my lab trying to answer the question, now that we had cloned some genes, activated those genes. So we wanted to know where genes were active. The second aspect was that the animal that we work on, which is a very small roundworm, it's only a millimeter long as an adult, this animal is transparent. You can look right through it. And so when I heard that there was a protein that was fluorescent, that it would give off light, I put these ideas together and said, oh, if we could only have this protein active whenever the gene is active, we would be able to see the gene turned on because we would be able to see green in the cells in our transparent animal. So I think it was the combination of this background, worrying about the problems of how we were going to look for gene expression, and then hearing about a protein that seemed to fit all the criteria I wanted uh, to answer the question. So I, creativity is perhaps being a little open to influences that you really don't expect. People try to do the best they can. I think you try to make the best, you know, the best of whatever you do. Um, I don't know that I necessarily uh, try for excellence all the time. I try for, I try to answer questions in my science. Um, in my life, I think one of the things is practice. One of the things I enjoy doing a lot outside of the lab is something that was started actually by my father, who was a, a professional guitarist for a while. Uh, he gave me my first guitar. This is now almost 50 years ago. And I've been playing classical guitar ever since. And I'm still practicing to get better at it. I would not say that I'm excellent at it, but I keep practicing at it. I think. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what it means to uh, try to be excellent. You just try to do the best you can. In, in terms of, I've had some wonderful people. I've been very privileged to work with a number of very talented, and very intelligent people who I, at various times, I've looked up to for a variety of reasons. Uh, I sometimes, however, the best mentor, I think at different times in one's life, one needs different types of mentors. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I uh, worked with a man, Robert Perlman, who uh, would let me walk into his office any time of the day or night uh, and talk about whatever crazy idea I had. And he was very supportive. As we're still good friends. He's very, still very supportive. And that freedom to be able to say anything that was on my mind uh, was really quite wonderful. And so I, I think that was a very important uh, part of my development. When I went off to the Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge for my postdoc with Sydney, that was a very different situation. Now, all of us talked an enormous amount, so that, that hadn't changed. People were available and it was a, a wonderfully interactive place. But the wonderful thing about the postdoc was that I was left completely on my own to decide on the experiments to do. I was given sort of infinite freedom. One wonderful thing about that lab in Cambridge, England, was they had wonderful, uh, a wonderful stock room, wonderful shops to build anything. You really couldn't complain about any of the facilities. But on the other hand, having virtually perfect facilities, wonderful colleagues, the responsibility came on to you to do the work. So I no longer had an excuse. There was no way of saying, oh, the equipment's not very good, or oh, I can't get this supply, or I don't think I can do this. Everything was limited finally by my imagination. And I think that was a wonderful thing to have at that stage in my career, to be told, okay, now it's completely up to you. No one's gonna tell you even the general direction you should go. You decide what's important for your science. And I think that, having, in a sense, no mentor 
was even more important uh, in my scientific development. So I think we all start as children. I've seen this in my daughter. I think I remember it from my childhood. It's being curious about the world, wondering what it's about and how it works. I think this is something that uh, the lucky ones of us uh, retain uh, throughout their lives. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to get actually paid to investigate problems of biology that I'm interested in. So I think curiosity is very important. If you mean how my discoveries take place, uh, usually uh, one discovery or one finding leads to questions that give rise to another. So it's a continual chain of discovery, uh, being curious about that result, and going off and hopefully finding something else. So I think uh, curiosity is, is, is very important, and I think it's one of these things that sometimes uh, we have to remind ourselves, uh, what other question can we ask of our data? And I think when that happens, we get some very interesting new directions. Genetics doesn't determine what we do. It doesn't determine what sort of people we are. It determines our proteins. It uh, shows us, it, it, it allows interactions. And we're still learning much about what's made in the human body and how those things interact, and we don't know. But how one applies them, whether it's uh, in ourselves or how one uh, applies scientific information, I think is something that's up to the individual. Uh, I don't think we are completely determined. I don't think anyone could imagine that we're completely all that we do. Um, we, in my opinion, we have uh, quite a lot uh, that we have to take responsibility for. Um, now, there's certain things that I cannot do. I'm not going to grow any more than I am. Uh, I have reached my maximum height. Um, I, but given that, uh, I know from, uh, as I told you before, my guitar playing, having, uh, you know, practicing makes things different. It changes and one uh, be responsible. I don't think that one can say, well, it's genetics. We're done. <laughs> That's everything is complete that we can input into this. Clearly, environment is a very important factor in how organisms develop, as is randomness, in the sense that a gene can be turned on or be capable of being turned on, but how in a particular case it is turned on or utilized and what the time course of that is, that can be quite variable. So even just having the components don't actually dictate that something's going to happen in an absolutely defined variability that's inherent in biology. And in fact, we're finding this more and more even at the very uh, basic levels where when people look at gene expression, we know that a gene is capable of being turned on. We know a gene can be turned on in a particular set of cells but how much that gene is turned on in a particular one of those cells can be quite variable. Well, I think it first was a challenge to try to see if I could present my ideas in 21 minutes. You can see I really enjoyed talking. Uh, I think it was also the idea of being able to meet people outside of the people I usually get to meet. And uh, those sort of interactions I, uh, I enjoy quite a lot. So the idea of meeting people from other walks of life that were trying to confront this same 21 minute deadline uh, was intriguing to me.